I like to critique myself. Iron sharpens iron, so I have to sharpen myself, Myrtle. Amen. Um, my wife, she makes fun of me. She said, your last message only got two views, and the two views is you. So I said, well, that's all right. <laughs> all right. That's all right. Well, how many of you glad to be in God's house today? Amen. We're going to go before the Lord in prayer. Um, if you have a prayer request and you're watching online, just be sure to comment your prayer request. We'll see it at some point today. Um, anybody in here got a prayer request this morning that they want to bring before the Lord? Anybody? Yeah, a friend of the family who uh, lost a two young man's brother. So I don't know. We'll, we'll be praying. Anybody? My family. Your family. Okay. Anybody else? We will be remembering lost children. Amen. Uh, Jim's mom. Y'all remember me? Uh, I'm praying. I'm praying for some things that I believe is going to happen for me real soon. So y'all be remembering me in prayer. Amen. Uh, is that it? Dwight, will you take us to the Lord in prayer this morning? Father, we thank you for this opportunity, God, just to go on together in your house. Yes. Father, we thank you. We lift you up and praise you, God. We thank you for everything that you're doing in our lives. And the one that's online, Father, that needs any prayer requests, that needs any prayers answered, God. We thank you for it, God. We thank you for every answer that you do give us, Father. Yes. Whether we want it or not, God, I know you're there to give it to us, Father. And we thank you. We lift you up, God, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Um, we were supposed to have a singing next Saturday. We ain't really heard much about it because of everything that's been going on. But I will call that group today and go ahead and cancel on them and reschedule them. We were going to have a big meal and all that stuff. Uh, they were supposed to actually be here uh, back in March, I think it was. Um, no, it was back in January. But the guy that sings with them, their bass singer, is the only crime scene investigator in Cherokee County. And they had a shooting that day, so he had to be on scene. So, uh, so that's where that's where they were at. So we'll have to call and reschedule them. Um, so I believe everything's going to start, begin to hopefully get back to normal over the month of May. Hopefully. That's what I'm praying for anyway. I miss being in church with, with, with everybody. I mean, I love who all is here today, but I miss seeing the people just pile in. I miss seeing Gracie come in. I miss seeing Earlene come in. I miss seeing Dottie come in. And, you know, but I believe that there's a shakening about to go on in the American church. I believe there's about to be a major outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our churches. So if you have your Bibles, go with me this morning to the book of Isaiah. We're going to start reading in verse 5, the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verse 5 through 8. I've done a devotional uh, this past week called Dangerous Prayer, and I got to day four of my devotional, and that's the message that I'm going to preach today. I thought it was just absolutely phenomenal, and I believe the Lord allowed me to see that, to preach it here this morning to you guys and to preach it to whoever is joining online. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5, and we're going to read through verse 8. Now, you've heard this read many, many times in church. So I'm not going to read the first four verses, but I'm going to read the last four verses. The Bible says, So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then the ones of the seraphim flew to me, having his hand a live coal which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. And I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we just praise you for the reading of your word, God. 
We just praise you, Lord, that your word pierces and transforms, God, our lives. Lord, your word changed and transformed my life. And God, I pray going forward in this message that you would anoint the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, God. And everything I say and do up here would be solely controlled by you, the Holy Spirit, and nothing else, God. Lord, let this message, God, be delivered and be received, God, to the people sitting in here and to the people listening online, God. Lord, I pray, God, that you'll get all the glory and all the honor for it, for it's in every... For, for God, for it's in your name we pray, Lord Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Kind of got a little ahead of myself on my prayer there. Isaiah 6, verses 5 through 8. Each week, thousands of needs flood our churches. From prayer cards in our services to phone calls during the week, our online, requ our online requests through social media, so you won't be surprised to know the most common phrase we hear each week in church and is one that I'm delighted to fulfill. Brother, will you please pray for this? Will you please pray for that? I consider it a privilege and an honor and a joyful responsibility to pause and lift up a need before the throne of God, asking Him to have mercy, asking Him to move, asking Him to guide, asking Him to provide, and asking Him to act to do a miracle for people that I know and love. Even for people that I don't know. But I still love them. Amen. <clears throat> Each week someone asks that God would heal their loved ones from cancer. Help a neighbor find a job or restore a hurting marriage. Young people request prayer to get into the college of their choice. To help pray for that college or to deal with the pain of a parent's divorce. Some people pray for a spouse. Others ask for help. To forgive a person who may have hurt them. Even though the requests vary. People are asking God consistently to do something for them. Or someone they love. Help me God. Help someone I love. Lord I need you. Father would you please God do something for me. Our prayer to God never ends. Please hear me. <laughs> we should definitely pray this way. And we should always invite God's presence. God's power and God's peace to intervene in our lives. We should ask God to do miracles on our behalf. We should lift up our loved ones and remind ourselves of how God can move in their lives. We should seek the Lord in all our needs. Can you say amen? amen. <laughs> but what if, instead of asking God to just do something for us, we pray the dangerous, self-denying prayer of availability to our Heavenly Father? What if we prayed perhaps the most dangerous prayer of all? Send me, Lord. Use me, Lord. Isaiah prayed such a prayer of unreserved availability in the presence of God. The Old Testament prophet retells of his encounter with the Holy One when God asked, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then, and then in verse 6, Chapter, I mean, in chapter 6, verse 8, without knowing the details and without knowing when or where, Isaiah prayed this stunning prayer and life-altering prayer. He said, you like, here I am, send me. Amen. Notice Isaiah didn't ask for any details. He didn't ask God where. He didn't ask him when. Or he didn't even ask him what could happen. This is why this prayer can feel so dangerous. God, send me, use me. I'm not asking for any details. I don't need to know the benefits. I don't need to know if it'll be easy or if I'll enjoy it. Because of who you are, my God, my King, I'm going to trust you. Amen. Hallelujah. Because you are the sovereign one over the universe. I surrender my will to you. Every part of me, take my eyes, take my mouth, take my ears, take my heart. Take my hands, take my feet, and guide me towards your will. I trust you, God. And if he asks, will you go? And if your answer is yes, you need to say, God, I'm in your hands. Amen? Amen. Imagine if you prayed this way. Are you sick of safe prayers? Let me tell you something. This devotional really, really spoke to me. Let me tell you what a safe prayer is. On my way to work, okay? I live 10 minutes away from my job now. And somehow, I have to be there at 7. And the list is, what time do I leave? 653, 654. I don't know why I do this. I was leaving from Jim's house when we stayed over there at 6 o'clock in the morning, getting there 15 minutes early. But now, I, I don't know, I guess I'm just lazy. This is what a safe prayer is. 
You're rushing to get in the car to go to work, and you're on the way to work, and you say, oh, man, I didn't pray today. Lord, forgive me my sins. Touch my family. Watch over them. Touch my pastor. Touch my church folks. Amen. And now clocking in. That's a safe prayer. I believe God is calling the church during this time right now to get down to business with the Savior. Amen. It is time for us to stop playing around, even with our prayer lives. We say, hey, we got to quit playing church. Well, we got to quit playing Christianity. Amen. Listen, he wants us to pray to him. And a dangerous prayer is, Lord, send me. Lord, use me. We say it, but are we really willing to make the sacrifice for him to really send us and use us to do something? Are you sick of safe prayers? Are you tired of living for things that don't matter? Do you despise half-hearted, lukewarm Christianity? Then the dangerous prayer you need to be praying this morning is, Here I am, Lord. Send me. Lots of folks say, God, send me to foreign soul to do missionary work. God, send me here. God, send me there and everywhere else. When God is saying, first off, take a little drive through your towns and through your communities. Mission. You do ministry here first before I take you over here. Listen, I ain't got nothing against big time missionaries. I think it's cool for people to go overseas. I think God specifically designed people called according to that purpose. But my daddy used to stand in the pulpit of King's Creek Church of God and says, listen, people are asking for God to send them here and God to send them there. And God's telling you to go next door and knock on their door and tell them about Jesus. And you won't even do it. I know why. Because a lot of those people in the town know you passed. And you think, well, if I knock on their door and tell them about Jesus, they're just going to sit there and snarl their nose up at me and say, well, they just remember, hey, you used to be, don't you come over my house throwing those rocks when you live in a glass house. <laughs> Listen, I know how people are. I live in the town I grew up in. Some of those folks don't believe I've changed, but the good majority of them, Candy, has seen a change in me. And they knew nine years ago I was on my way to hell, but then nine years later I'm saying, here I am, Lord, send me. What can I do for you in this town, Jesus? Let's make it clear. I love missionary work. But, we, but, but if you take a little drive through our communities, there's a great work that needs to be done here in Cherubal. And I cannot wait until the Lord clears a path for me to be completely devoted to this area. Now, I'm not moving up here. <laughs> Taxes are a little too high. But I will drive up here every day, amen? Send me, Lord, is a dangerous prayer. Because when you put yourself out there, you are forfeiting the guilt of your own past transgressions. That's what he said. Touch the cold to my lips and your iniquities is gone. And if you say, God, I'm going, Chris, you forfeit the past transgressions that once plagued you. Can somebody say amen? Your sins have been forgiven. So therefore, no matter what you've done in life, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've said, if you call upon the name of the Lord to save you and you genuinely mean it, you have put yourself in a position so you can be used mightily by a mighty God. But this is all you have to do is say, God, send me. Mm -hmm. Diane's son-in-law, Chris and Diane's son-in-law. This man's more dedicated than anybody I've ever seen in my life. He's got these preachers meeting on Saturday night for a prayer meeting. He's got these preachers meeting on Sunday night for a prayer meeting. He, he gets up every morning and he sends out a mass text encouraging people. He, he, he gets up and he puts on Facebook the chapters that we got to read for that particular day. Just dedicated, just dedicated. I believe that when he said, God, I'm going to do a work for you, send me. I believe that man meant business, amen? God uses ordinary people in extraordinary ways for his glory. We're in the middle of a crisis in this country and God is wanting to see how the church will respond. Just like right here in Judah, the Lord is asking today, look, I know that things are not comfortable any longer, but I'm asking who am I going to send in the midst of all this? How will you answer the call of God? If you say, here I am, Lord, can I go over three things that we're going to have to do to, to mean business with God. Number one, you have to give up your agenda and follow the agenda of God. Yes. Somebody say amen. amen. You have to give up your agenda and follow the agenda of God. So many times we want to do things ourselves. 
create our own rules and thoughts. America is guilty of that. And one day every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. Your agenda won't get you anywhere in the kingdom of God. Amen. So oftentimes we do our very best to push an agenda of setting ideas. But there's one problem. We forget about the one who is sending us to do the work. So many times, Pally, we get in positions and we get in leadership and then we want to imply our own ideas and we want to apply how we think things should go. I've got a book at home called The People of the Spirit. I got that book from uh, Pastor Mike and Miss Wendell. And I read, I've yet to read that thing all the way through. That book is that thick. But it's got some good stuff in it. But you see how these revivals, Myrtle, begin to break out. You see how the move of God just begins to just, just, just overwhelm society, Carolyn. You see how the move of God just begins to just spread like wildfire. And, and, and every story ends with the same thing. Somebody started implying new ideas and new ways on how to make it better. And then the whole thing just fell apart. Somebody got away from God. Amen? The Azusa Street Revival. That man was on fire for the Lord. Things were happening in Los Angeles, California. Things were just going crazy over there. And God was being glorified and God was being honored and God was being lifted up like Johnston. And the man made one mistake when he invited a Bible school teacher that he had from way back when. The guy came and he wanted to criticize and judge and condemn everything they were doing. Brother Seymour should have never invited that man there because when, when that man taught Richard Seymour in Bible college, because Richard Seymour was a black man, he made him sit outside of the classroom to learn because he didn't want him in the classroom with the other white kids. That should have been your first notion. I ain't bringing you out here, brother. So many times we, 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 we go back to things and I don't know why Brother Richard Seymour would have done that. That's been almost 100 years ago. I don't know. But all I can tell you is this right here. We've got to continue, Pastor Mike, following the agenda of God. Amen. If we say, here I am, Lord, send me on our way, we don't need to write up a bunch of rules. We have the rule book right here. Amen? Amen. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lead not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. He will lead, guide, and direct you if you will only answer, yes, Lord, send me. I'm tired of rules. I'm tired of the denominational guidelines. It's worrying people and it's bringing a burden on people. And they think they are not or will never be good enough to do something for God. You can get out here, and I'm not picking on the Assemblies of God, okay? I love the Assemblies of God. One day, Elizabeth, you and I are going to have to go down that path. But, we stay on fire for God, man. You're on fire, Candy. And you're just doing everything for the Lord. You're ministering to people. You're out at the mission, and you're, and you're doing this, and you're doing that. You're serving this in your community. And you do it for years and years and years and years and years and years. And then you got all these preachers that's batching for you. Maybe I'm getting a little personal this morning. That's okay. Can I get a little personal this morning? Okay. You do all this. And then when they want to sit down and talk to you, they want to know what happened before you got saved. Not going to talk about it with you. Amen. Because when Jesus said, when he forgives me joy, he cast it into the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered anywhere. Never to be remembered anymore. So Pastor Mike, Chris Collins, when I get to heaven, he's not going to ask me about my past life. He's going to ask me about what I did after the day I got saved. Imagine if you prayed this way. Wait a minute, I lost the spot. It's worrying people and bringing a burden on people. And they think they are not and won't be ever good enough for God. If our rules and regulations cause one person to veer off the path of righteousness to their own, we're in the wrong. Yeah. If they're saying, Lord, send me, Lord, send me, and you, and they're on the path and they're doing the work of the Lord, and, and some religious nut goes to them and says, All right, there's, there are some things we're going to have to change about you. Now, I know appearance is everything, and I know this is that, but you cannot hide your scars from your past life. 
You cannot hide your decisions from your past life. You cannot do that. You can only erase them, hopefully, from your mind and go on and do something for the Lord. But so many times, there's somebody on the road to righteousness and they're doing the work and they're doing things for God and they're doing this and they're doing that and then some religious note yanks them to the side and says, well, that tattoo on the arm, you're going to have to cover it up. Well, you know, we, we, we've, we've been watching you. And, 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 you know, there's something you just need to do to make yourself appear a little better. And then what's that person do? Man, what am I doing wrong? What, what am I doing this? What, what am I doing wrong? And then they just eventually just fall off the path. Mm -hmm. Because some person did not see the good in them. They just saw the one bad thing. Now, if you can do it in love, yeah, do it in love. If you can do it with an attitude of kindness, yeah, do it with an attitude of kindness. But if you're going to pull somebody off to the side and make them feel like the world's worst sinner and they fall off the path, that's on the person that pulled them off the path. Because the Bible says he would rather be a tie millstone around your neck be casted into the sea. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, there are some things we must clean up about ourselves. There's some things I must clean up about myself. Even to this day. Hey, I like pro wrestling, but sometimes i got to turn that stuff off, man. <laughs> well, I ain't really watched it here lately because wrestling without fans just ain't the same, Pastor Mike. <laughs> it's like going down here to the armor and Joy and watching it. I'm not living my life to please a man or a certain organization. I'm living my life to please God. And if you say, yes, Lord, send me, your agenda goes right out the window. And you begin to pursue the agenda of God Almighty. The second thing, we must lose complacency. So often we get comfortable in setting our ways, we shut everything down. Sometimes God sends you into some pretty unknown, into some pretty unknown places just so he can be made known. If you say, send me, let me give you some verses to live by. Joshua 1 9 says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Mark 16, 15. He said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to all creation. Isaiah 42, 16. When I was studying this message, this verse came up on the devotional. And I will lead you in a blind way that they do not know. In paths that they have not known, I will guide them and I will turn the darkness before them into light. The rough places into level ground. These are the things that I do, and I do not forsake them. I want to share with you my personal story of how the Lord led me back to victory life. Chet, can I do that? See, that verse right there says, I will lead you in a blind way that they do not know, in paths that they have not known. Can I tell you that the church is going down a path right now that they do not know? They say, man, we really want to have church, but, you know, this, that, and the other. We've been pulled out of our comfort zone. God is seeing how we're going to respond to this, Candy. He's going to say, hey, will you be a good citizen, but still lift me up in the meantime. He's saying, hey, listen, when this is all said and done with, Pastor Mike, there's going to be a Joel 2 outpouring of these churches. Amen. I really believe that. The way I came back to Victory Life, me and Elizabeth had just got married. We were youth pastors at a church in Gastonia, uh, the Father's House Church. Great group of people there. And uh, we, we were just on fire for the Lord. Uh, we went to a conference up in Newton at Christ Alive Church. And there, uh, anybody heard of Karen Wheaton? Yeah. You heard of the Ramp Conference? Yeah. That's in Alabama. Well, they brought the ramp conference up there, and there was a preacher, man, I still listen to this preacher today. He said, man, he preached a message, and I'll try to share it today. He said, what are you doing in the gap? He said, when you go from glory to glory, what are you doing in between the glories? That was just a powerful message. But anyway, so, so we go to that conference in October of 2014, and just a phenomenal time, phenomenal two nights. Some of the most powerful services I've ever been in. Well, the second night, Casey Doss, who was at that time the senior pastor of the ramp, 
He was preaching, and when he done the altar call to wife, I ran to that altar, sobbing like a baby, man. I, I don't think I've cried. Well, I probably have cried that bad since then. But I cried. I left a lot of snot on that altar. Amen. <laughs> but but uh, he gets to me because there's hundreds of people that's being prayed for. And he gets to me and he puts his arm around me and he says, after tonight, son, everything for you changes. He just kept on walking. That's all he said. That's all he said. Well, this was 2014. In 2012, when Pastor Mike got here, two weeks after he got here, I left. I remember Pastor Mike preaching up here on the platform. And one of the first things he said, I promise you I'll never get up here on this platform unprepared. And he's kept that promise. I've never seen him get up here unprepared. So two weeks after that, I was part of the 40 that left. I never saw demons on top of the church, though, okay? I, ne I, I never saw any of that. But in 2012, I left, and I started going over there to that church in Gastonia. Me and Elizabeth, we got married December of 2013. And then 2014, we, we were youth pastors, and everything was going great, and everything was going good. And then I go to this conference, and he says, after tonight for you, everything changes. Well, that was on a Friday. Well, Saturday, I go to a thrift store in Kings Mountain. I'm shopping, and I'm telling these people in there that I know about how God moved and all this and about, uh, about the power and the glory of God that, that, that was in that place and, and things that I wanted to do. And there was a lady in there that I had never met in my life. She said, hey, let me give you a name of a young man. I said, okay. She said, his name's Dylan Wiston. I said, all right. I said, well, I'll call him. So I get home. A couple days pass, I call him. And I say, Man, I heard you got the set apart series going on. Well, what's going on? Man, I've been part of this church since I was 16 years old. And I said, and I said, man, so what's going on? And we talked, and I said, well, where, where do you have these services at, Myrtle? And he said, well, we'd like to have one at Lineburg Park. He said, but for the most part, we have them at my grandpa's church. I said, well, where is your grandpa's church? <laughs> He said, Victory Life Assembly of God in Charlotte on 150. You ever heard of it? Well, I just hung my head. I said, oh, man. Yeah, I've heard of it. So I just clammed up, Bert. I said, all right, man, well, I'll be in touch with you. When somebody says we'll be in touch with you, that means they're never going to call you back. All right. All right. So... A few months passed, and it was in January, they put me on third shift doing a project there at Walmart, me and my buddy Ryan, and I was asleep one day on her love seat, and I woke up, and Elizabeth was in the recliner, and I woke up, and I put my hand on the back of my neck, and it was, it was right after 12 o'clock, and I said, I got to call that Dylan Wisnick kid. She said, she said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> she said, well, call him then, because that's the way Elizabeth, she talks to me. I say, hey, Elizabeth, I want to go get pizza. Okay, well, go get pizza, but I don't want pizza. <laughs> so I said, well, I'm going to call him. So I called him, and I said, look, man, I was on the board at that church when your grandpa first got there. I need to call him and make some things right. So the first person I called was Joyce Crumpton. Not even... 10, 15 seconds in the conversation, I was, I was crying. I got off the phone. I went back inside. I said, the Lord's about to send us to victory life. So, I was very comfortable at the church I was at. Very comfortable. So, I had told Joyce we was going to come over here February 28, 2015. I'll never forget it. And the week leading up to that, I just felt led to fast. When you say, God, I'm going to fast for something, that is a dangerous prayer. So I went up to Malachi's room, because the Lord even thought about then, but Malachi was going to be here in a couple months. So I went up to Malachi's room, and I just laid on the floor, and I cried. And I said, God, if this is really what you want me to do, show me. God, I'll go. Send me, God. If this is what you want me to do, send me. So I get here 
on the 28th, and I sit right there where Chris and Diane are sitting. First person I see is Pastor Mike. He comes up to me and he shakes my hand and he asks me, did I sing? And I said, well, I sang by, you know, I played my guitar. And he said, well, go on up there and play. He says it was awful. Randy Whisper says it was awful. I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> but I said, God, you're going to have to show me in a big way what you're doing before I make this change, God. See, God was pulling me out of my comfort zone. You're going to have to show me, God. So, not even five minutes into the service, I was on the platform. I was telling God in my mind, not good enough. Not good enough, God. Well, then Pastor, he's up here at the pulpit, and he says, he says, Josh grew up in this church, and he turned around like this. Man, I remember this stuff. This is very nostalgic for me this morning, because when I was studying this message, this all came back to my remembrance. He turned around and he looked at me because I was sitting right there where the cross is right now. And he says, I'm not going to preach forever and I'm going to need a replacement. I just looked. I said, what? I said, man, that's crazy. <laughs> so I go back to my seat and he preaches a phenomenal message. Well, we had a lot of people from Morganton who came here at that time. We had 20-something people to come on a bus here from Morganton. So... There was, there was a young man who was sitting, I think about it, at the end of that aisle, and he got out and he come down to the altar, and Pastor Mike went to lay his hands on him. Because you ever seen Pastor Mike lay hands on him? He puts his hand right here, and then he puts that hand right there, and, and he didn't even touch him. He said, no. He said, I'm not going to do this. He said, young man, Josh, come down here. You called to preach. You come down here and pray for him. Oh, man, the spirit fell. The spirit fell mightily. I told Elizabeth, I said, you know what we're going to do, don't you? So, when we walked out of the church, you know, because this church kind of sits on a hill, and we walked out of the church, there was a full moon, and that moon was beaming right down, boom, off bigger life. Now, some people might say, well, it just must have been a full moon. No, that was God telling me where I was going. Amen? Because I had spent my time in prayer, Diane, that week, saying, Lord, if you want me to go here, send me. God, I already feel the tug. God, send me. Send me, God. You know what, if you're serious about God sending you somewhere, you'll pray to him, God, I'll go. I don't care who gets mad. I don't care what happens. God, I'm going to go because I know you're going to be glorified and lifted up. Amen? You have to get rid of your complacency. The third thing, you have to surround yourself with folks who are going to help you. Surround yourself with people who are going to encourage you, compliment you, give you godly advice, but also surround yourself with those people that will tell you things that you're doing wrong in a loving manner. Don't surround yourself with people who do this. Well, you're just doing it all wrong. I mean, surround yourself with people like Pally that says, hey, Josh, your guitar's a little too loud. No, Josh, your guitar's just too loud. I don't even want to play today. Who wants to be around people like that? Nobody. Surround yourself with people that are going to help you. If you surround yourself with people who bicker, complain, gripe, nitpick, criticize, always finding something negative, you will eventually turn into that person. Surround yourself with folks who chase God, who pursue God, who encourage you, strengthen you, make you better, that will pray for you and help you seek God. Pastor LJ, who used to be here a long time ago, he preached a message one time that says we must surround ourselves <coughs> with good company. And if you are telling the Lord, yes, Lord, I'll go wherever you send me, make sure you've got good company around you as you're going. I'm very blessed to be a part of a church that everybody in here is good company. Everybody in here is good company. Harvest that knowledge that you receive from your peers. Listen and learn from folks who have more wisdom and experience than you got. I had a dream a few weeks back that Pastor was preaching inside Ingalls. I think it was Ingalls. That Pastor was preaching inside Ingalls. He's just standing up at the front preaching. And the whole time he's preaching, I'm getting groceries through the store. All right, if you never had Ingalls fried chicken, you're missing out. Especially their macaroni and cheese. That's grandma's macaroni and cheese on Thanksgiving Day. But look, 
I was shopping. The whole time he was preaching, this is a spiritual dream. I'm going somewhere with this. So, when I check out, and when I get home, I open up my trunk. The groceries wasn't in there. I open up my car. The groceries wasn't in there. I didn't bring a single bag of groceries in my house with me when I left that grocery store. You know what the Lord told me there? We're sitting in church listening, but we're not taking any of it with us. Amen. 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 You got to harvest what's being preached from this pulpit. Amen. But it don't just stop here. You've got to harvest the Bible every day of the week. Right. Elizabeth, I was washing dishes. We do the Bible reading in one year. And I got up this and I was washing dishes. And we're in First Chronicles. I can't say none of their names. All right, so I just put that thing right there at the sink and I follow along as I wash dishes. And Elizabeth sometimes would have a little fun. They'd say, they'd say some name and she'd say, oh, well. And then she would say, say the name. And I'd say, hey, look, I got to listen to it. There ain't no way I can read these names. Amen? But still, you have to read the Word of God. Amen? You have to harvest that, that, that Word that is being spoke from the pulpit. You have to... You have to study the word for yourself. Amen? You can't be like the dream to where you go in the grocery store and you're picking up all the goods and you're picking up everything that you know you can get your hand on. And then when you get home, you don't have any of it. Do you see where I'm going with this? If you're telling God, yes, I'll go wherever you send me. Make sure you got good company around you. Harvest that knowledge that you receive from your peers. Listen and learn from folks that have more wisdom and more experience. You can hear all this knowledge, and if you don't carry it with you, it's no good. Proverbs 12, 15, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to his own advice. <coughs> Proverbs 15, 22, Without counsel, plan fails, but with many advisors they succeed. Listen to what 1 Corinthians says in chapter 15, verse 33. It says, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Bad company will ruin a good church too. Amen? Amen? You cannot surround yourself with people who expect you to fail in the long run. You can't surround yourself with people that will say, well, you can do this, but you know it ain't never going to work out. No, surround yourself with people that say, hey, look, I'm right here with you, man. I'm praying, and we're going to seek God together. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. As I close today, Telling the Lord to send you is a very dangerous prayer. Because it comes with so much joy. It comes with so much perseverance. But it also comes with a lot of pain and a lot of heartache. If you don't surround yourself with people who are good for you. The thing about me and my walk with the Lord. And I'm going to say it on the air. If I didn't get to this church. I think I was going to die spiritually. And if I didn't get back to this church. I don't know where I would be without God. Yeah, I was preaching a lot. And I was doing a lot of good things for the Lord. But I need Pastor Mike in my life. I need Dusty Waycaster in my life. I need these folks that are going to pull me to the side lovingly and say, hey, tone it down a little bit. He might tell me that today. I don't know. <laughs> don't be afraid to step out of your comfort zone. You have to give up your agenda and chase God's plan for your life. So if you're praying today, Lord, send me, be prepared for a journey that will forever be great to be on. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we just praise you for the word today, God. Lord, I just praise you, God, that you gave me a voice to preach it. Lord, I thank you for the people of this church, God. I pray, Jesus, that as we are going through this pandemic and we're going through this tough time, Lord, I pray... That we'll continue to honor you and honor you only, God. Lord, that we'll not go after our own agendas. God, we'll not go after anything else, God, that's not bringing you glory. But, Lord, we'll pursue you with everything inside of us. God, we'll pursue you, God, and not some man-made rules or some man-made regulations. But, God, we would spend this time, God, that we have at home, God. And, and Lord, we would spend this time, Lord, that we have together at your feet, Jesus. Lord, pour out your spirit upon this place, God, like never before. 
God, I know that there is going to be a shakening here in Victory Life. And God, I know that there is going to be a shakening, God, all across this country, Lord, in the American church. Lord, those that are truly hungry and thirsty for it, God, I know that you're going to pour your spirit out upon them. Lord, touch Pastor Mike and Miss Linda today. Lord, I pray a special blessing upon them. Lord, those that are sick in body today, God, I pray that you touch them and heal them. Lord, I pray, God, for the people that are here this morning, the people that are listening online, God. Lord, I speak a special blessing on them. Lord, have your way in this church, God. Lord, send us. Send us to charitable crafts. Waco, Boston, Lord, Lord, send us. Lord, we're going to be ready. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you for coming. Well, I'm not talking about dangerous. Oh, no, I'm done. <laughs>